see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rush from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy and Compassion. And I'm here with Joe Brumer. And uh, we're here as part of the Emergency Empathy Response Team. And what our team is about is that when we find articles that are kind of negative or critical or just kind of muddled about the nature of empathy and compassion, uh, that we want to get together and talk about them and kind of just maybe uh, analyze them, but also empathize with the authors or, or producers, video producers that are putting you know, these uh, uh, documents and articles and videos together. So um, anything to add to that, uh, Joe? I think that covers it. Okay. So today we've got an article that we want to look at. It's called uh, uh, Empathy and uh, Versus Compassion. And this was uh, written by, I think it's one or two people. You, uh, Kevin. It's, just, it's the one guy, Steve Kinney. Oh, Steve Kinney wrote it. Oh, okay. And it's for a blog called In This Corner. Um, which so, I guess these both these guys that, that write on this blog have sort of differing um, points of view um, on on issues of the you know whatever the issue of the day is, and it sounds like um, you know Steve has just some interesting things to write about um, empathy and compassion, and and he appears to to be writing about com empathy as um, an unproductive intellectual adventure. And compassion as more about action. And the case that he seems to be making is that, and, and this is just assuming that I understand what he's trying to say, uh, it, that empathy doesn't result in, in action. And that he sort of aligns empathy with liberals and compassion with conservatives. Mm. Um, and sort of makes the case, or it sounds like he's trying to make the case that um, liberals are all about empathy while conservatives are all about compassion. Um, so I, I'm only assuming that's that's really what he's trying to say. Um, in the process of that, he makes some really interesting claims about empathy that I'd be curious to see how he came to the conclusions about them. Because um, they seem to be, they're just interesting. So I, I'm not really sure I understand what, what he's trying to say about about empathy, especially how he ends the entire thing by saying, empathy looks to understand and label the suffering while treating the symptoms from as great a distance as possible. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure how... how does he come to that conclusion about empathy? Where does he get the sort of facts to back up that assumption yeah so there's a i actually posted on the site i posted uh, a link to a web page i have on definitions on my site culture of empathy dot com slash uh references slash definitions and i kind of showed it shows kind of the, the traditional definitions of empathy and I didn't, I don't, you know, not, what they're saying here doesn't really fit from my understanding of what empathy is. Uh, sometimes people think that empathy, because you're kind of present and that you're, you're not trying to fix someone or you're trying to analyze them or, uh, you know, trying to uh, sympathize with them, that there's a distance there. And really, for me, it's, and, and there's like a detachment. I'm detached, I'm just looking at what you're saying. But really, empathy is about presence, being with that person as what, and it's actually even, it's more presence and more closeness and more involvement than analysis, than uh, sympathy, than, uh, you know, treating the symptoms per se, uh, trying to fix the person, because you're, you're there and totally, uh, engaged with the people that you're uh, uh, empathizing with. 
And then from there, maybe some kind of action can kind of grow out of that. Right. Well, and he starts off the article with an empathy definition that he gets from Webster, which is interesting because part two of that, or the second part of the definition from Webster, talks about empathy being an action. Uh -huh. And then he follows that by saying that, that empathy doesn't really have enough action for him. Uh -huh. So I, I, I find some of that curious. I'd be interesting how the, how the author, Steve, sort of explains those things if given the chance. Um. Oh, he says, uh, we Catholics prefer to call them corporal and spiritual works of mercy at the very beginning. They are requirements of our faith. So somehow he's, he's mm -hmm. referencing something about narcissism. Uh, I mean, if we right. start, I have been preoccupied the last two weeks with the situation that readers Sean O'Donnell would call narcissistic and perhaps a vain attempt to assuage my subconscious racism. We Catholics prefer to call them the corporal and spiritual works of mercy and they are requirements of our faith. I'm not sure what that means. Mm -hmm. Something about narcissism. I mean, narcissism is where you're just concerned with yourself and not can you know you're not empathizing with someone else uh during this most recent undertaking and with uh vacious commentary vacious or vac or vacuous what is that that, that arose from the right the Ravi and Zimmerman case still resonating in my mind. A thorough a thought came to me. The big divide between liberals and conservatives can best be described by the former preoccupation with empathy and with and the latter is with compassion. So that's what you're saying. It's right. like setting it up. If I'm liberal, then I've got empathy and otherwise it's compassion. Uh for right. so it yes yeah, and that's why the article is empathy versus Compassion, which is kind of like stand-ins for, um, you know, liberals and conservatives. And then there's the definition that you talked about. And I think it's one of the things I find interesting about this article is that as he talks about empathy and compassion, he's working from linguistic definitions rather than scientific definitions. So he's not looking at this, he's looking at it from, you know, how language defines empathy yeah. or, or language or a dictionary defines compassion, maybe even how Catholics define them. Um, he's not really talking about the functional understanding of how empathy works. So it's more focused on how we define empathy, mm. less focused on how empathy works. Uh -huh. and, not so much from experience and the... the experiential and scientific right. because, because you can't escape the fact that you can't have compassion without empathy mm. <laughs> that's how i mean if, if it's my understanding from people like friends to and from you know uh, you know I'm trying to think who else uh, i'm sure you can list more names than i can but you know friends to or my or or anyone who's defined Marco empathy Iacovone. right exactly uh, yeah, the way that empathy works, that it works on mirror neurons, oxytocin. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a brain response that gives us understanding and moves us to action. Empathy is what moves us to have compassion, sympathy. Uh, it, 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 you can't have sympathy, compassion, or empathic action unless you have empathy. Yeah. It's, uh, so. Empathy is like the first step and a prerequisite for right. compassion. And uh, I've I've kind of run that by uh, like Paul Ekman, who's you know, uh, you know, one of the hundred most influ influential therapist, not therapist, but psychiatrist, psychologists. Mm -hmm. And I asked him that specific question: What's the difference between empathy and compassion? And he was saying, em uh, compassion is a slice of of the uh, empathy experience, basically. So it's the it's the part where empathy is applied to suffering of others. And I also ran that by Dacher Keltner, uh, who's uh, founder of, of the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley. And it was like a conference of like 400 people there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I raised my hand and said, is empathy 
a prerequisite and the first step towards a compassion. And he said, yeah, I, I, that's what I, I find. That's what I believe. So the right. compassion. So this is a this putting them against each other is is, is very inaccurate because it's really um, the first step and they're very intertwined. There, there right. is there's is another thing I've seen compassion. There's something where sometimes compassion is seen as a philosophical rule somehow you have to be compassionate so you're doing it from a rules you're doing some kind of an action that's called compassion but from a rules-based uh stance and i'm a little confused uh, about that because i don't think that that's accurate but some people maybe use it that way right well, and, and some of what the, the author of this article writes, and I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. I'm, it, I, I'm more just saying it's, it's a confusing take for me, where he says, if someone is homeless, it does not take empathy to help. It takes compassion. In fact, empathy is an excuse not to act as it calls for understanding and analysis, not action. Hmm. Oh, that's, that's a, um, that's, I, I'm not even sure how you can come up with that one. So I, I'd be very curious how the, the author came up with this conclusion that empathy is an excuse not to act. Well, I've, I've heard, um, you know, I don't even, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, with the, with the empathy, I, I see it kind of as four parts, you know, um, self-empathy, mirrored empathy, uh, imaginative empathy, and empathic action. So there's this whole kind of process that happens. And I've mm -hmm. heard... That you know, if you go into a uh, like a story that was told me by Dominic Barter, that got him really thinking about empathic action, or is that he was in a in a group, in a listening group, empathic listening group, and this woman came in and says, you know, my boyfriend is just sitting on the sofa while I'm watching washing the dishes, and he won't get up and help me, and I'm pissed off. You know? So she was all pissed off, angry about that. And the group listened to her, said, oh, you're really, you know, angry, you're, you know, you're whatever. And that act of being heard, she felt good. She felt heard. So it had that, you know, the oxytocin level kind of going up and she's feeling more relaxed. She goes home and then the next week she comes back and it's the same thing. You know, that it's like, I'm pissed off. My boyfriend's not doing the dishes. Everybody hears her. And, you know, and she feels heard and, and empathized with, feels good, feels better. She goes home. And then Dominic says the third, the third time I said, I don't know what's going to happen when she comes back. Sure enough, she comes back and nothing's happened. Nothing's changed in the relationship. And right. so it's, it's, that's where the mirroring part kind of comes in where she's kind of getting mirrored by other people. But the real thing is, her being in a you know empathic dialogue with her boyfriend, and that's what Dominic created was this um, restorative justice or restorative empathy process, is what I like to call it, where she needs to sit down with her boyfriend and have like an empathic dialogue with him, and have that you know that uh, connection happen between them, and that from there the action would grow. The action would be, how do we deal with this problem? Like, I feel like I'm doing all the work and you're just sitting watching TV on the sofa. And then the action would be, they, they kind of come up with some kind of agreement that's based on everybody's underlying, uh, you know, values and needs and desires and wants and all that being, right. and humanity I, being. And that's my understanding of Dominic Barter's work and his work with restorative circles is is just that it's it's um it, the idea is to help people come to uh understanding and take action based on being able to stand in each other's shoes yeah and that's completely the opposite of what and, and it's all based in in marshall rosenberg's nonviolent communication um which dominic barter's uh a strong proponent of um it that understanding fits with my uh, what I've read, what I understand about empathy, as well as what seems to be the accepted scientific approach to empathy. It seems to be at odds with this this article, 
written by this Steve Kinney. Yeah. But um, one part could be is that people don't see the active part of what happens with empathy, that when people really who are in conflict or in need, when they empathize with each other, that some kind of an action can grow, that grows out of it too. So, you know, it, it, they just might not see it or have, you know, clearly experienced it. Right. So, so then, um, oh, then he also says empathy is an intellectual exercise. Um, that was the other part that empathy is not just, it, that has an intellectual component, perspective taking, imaginative empathy, or sometimes called cognitive empathy. But he's not; they're not seeing the the mirror neuron component of the emotional empathy. Right. And and empathy, as I understand it, and and I really take this from Maya's book, um, Born for Love, that empathy basically has two pieces to it. Um, you, you know the the intellectual piece, and then the emotion, and then the, you know which is the perspective taking, and the emotional piece, which is sort of our emotional understanding of how other people feel. Um, which means I know by, and it is based on mirror neurons. It's based on I know that if you're smiling a certain way, and that you have a worried you know frown on your face, that I, I know that that. I can identify that as you being angry or sad or disappointed or and and name it. And then of course the intellectual piece of that is that I can stand in your shoes and understand why you're experiencing that. Yeah. And that you know then Franz Duval says that the next step after that would be sympathy. In other words, we take action, we're moved to fix things. Um in in sympathy. And but it starts with empathy. I forget where in the Age of Empathy, but if you read the Age of Empathy, that's one of the things that Franz Duval talks about. Is that you know, it, sort of sympathy is that place where we are moved to change what we've understood because of empathy, which means I see that you're in pain and I want to do something about it. And yeah. then there's a, a myriad of, of of replies to that, which can range anywhere from from sympathy to reciprocity to you know. A bunch of other stuff. Well, for me, I think that there's that you can take a step to action uh, without the sympathy part. That um, as we become kind of connected through through mirror neurons, that and I've seen this through, through dance, is that we kind of like want to help in dance. I want to kind of heighten the experience that I'm having with someone else, and we're kind of uh, mirroring each other and and. and you know, so it becomes more like a creative exploration, and how can and how can I contribute to your well-being, and how does the other person contribute to mine, and how do we kind of explore a reality together? So the sympathy part is would be kind of applied to maybe um, you know someone suffering, but and it's not, but then it's kind of like having sorrow. It adds it takes the focus away from the, the, the uh, connection, the mirroring connection, or even the perspective taking, and it takes it onto the person said, oh, you're in pain and suffering, I feel so sorrowful. And then it kind of becomes about that person. And, and well, I, I think you can do it without sympathy. You can, you can look at a person that's homeless and say, wow, I, I intellectually understand that that's difficult and it feels embarrassing and that that's a challenge. I under I can I can empathetically understand all of that and say I would like to do something about that. That's not the world that I want to live in. I want to help this person out. You could do all of that without ever saying, "Well, I feel really sorry for them." Yeah. You know, that which is what we would consider sympathy or that whole oh you poor thing. Yeah. You know, kind of sympathy. I'm I'm not a huge fan of sympathy stuff. Um it, because I think it is just, I think sympathy is destructive. I think we do things out of sympathy to alleviate pain, mostly in ourselves. I think we do things for empathy. We do things to alleviate the suffering of others. So that's sort of the difference between compassion and sympathy is that in compassion, we're actually doing it because we, we want to do stuff for other people. And that stems from empathy where sympathy on the other hand, we're doing it because we're suffering. <laughs> yeah. We feel, we feel, you know, I'm feeling in pain because you're in pain. 
So I'm going to alleviate my pain by doing something for you. I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. I just think it's more life enriching when the energy to help other people is about them, not us. Well, I find that I mean this this, this article is kind of what I I, I think uh, um, Kevin and I mean Steve is kind of coming from a conservative point of view is, is my understanding, right. and um, conservatives are very negative to about uh, with progressives about wanting to help that the helping others is kind of you're usurping their power by doing that. And that, that uh, and I think there's, and I think that that can kind of come out of sympathy. So the sympathy can be like a usurping of, of the power of the other. And the empathy is actually kind of like doing it together so that it's like not a usurping, taking the other person's power and, and being kind of like detached or something like that. Well, and, he, and the definition of compassion that he's using from Webster really paints compassion as sympathy. Yeah. Um, where you're, you're sharing oh, the suffering mm -hmm. of other people. I don't think we both have to suffer for me to want to help you. Yeah. That's right. It says <laughs> compassion, sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with the desire to alleviate it. Right. I mean, it could be, you know, that I've been wondering about that is, is it empathy and then taking empathic action? Uh, you know, if you see someone suffering or is it the compassion? I mean, it could be two different definitions of compassion. One is kind of empathy applied to suffering and then kind of wanting to alleviate it. And the other is turning empathy into uh, sympathy and then kind of wanting to alleviate the, the suffering. So there's kind of like two possible ways that people are actually using the word compassion. Mm. So it gets it gets kind of complicated. And it sounds sense. like you're saying is it has to do with intention. What is the the what's the outcome or intention that people have? What's the reasoning they're doing what they're doing? Is it to alleviate the suffering of themselves or is it to alleviate the suffering of someone else or a little of both? Yeah. And and I, I don't necessarily know that any of those are bad or good. Um, they are what they are. Okay, so let's see. Um, then he goes into talking about President Obama said that empathy, it is at the heart of our moral code. He goes on to define uh, the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, see the world through their eyes. As you may recall, he also made empathy the vital characteristic of his pick for Supreme Court justice. Uh, okay, he says Obama in, exhibits the liberal mindset, which is characterized by a complete disconnect with people who are different from them. I mean, that's getting a little. Yeah, that I'm, I. I think what the author's trying to say is that he would like to see, you know, more consideration, more connection between what he's saying are liberals, and he believes that that liberals are disconnected from, um, you know, what's really at the heart of people, which I, I don't necessarily personally agree with that. It, it appears to be what this person's truth is. Um, well, he's kind of, they're saying that because liberals are empathetic, that they can't see Zimmerman's point of view. You know what I mean, or that they they lead to judge him because you know saying Zimmerman's racist is a bit of a judgment, right? And they're right. saying people who are judging Zimmerman as racist are judging, and it's their empathy that's causing them to judgment, to do these judgments. Where I would say that, you know, empathy is actually raised by not judging. You know, to if we want right. to. The judgment is actually a dampening quality of judgment. It's one of the things that kind of inhibits it. Well, I, I, there was some recent um, research released about um, politics, you know, sort of the, the divides of politics affecting people's ability to empathize. Um, and... Uh, 
and, and basically saying that uh, liberals, uh, I, I forget which is which, but either liberals or conservatives or Republicans versus Democrats have a hard time being able to empathize with each other and that a, a barrier to that is politics, that politics changes our ability to to actually empathize with each other. I'm trying to remember who did that research. Um, yeah, I actually interviewed them. Um, it was, uh, yeah. It was, I can't, let me bring that up here. I've got it. Um, I think it was. Yeah, I was looking on your website to see if I could find that again. Yeah, I've, I've got um, it there. It's, um, okay, it was Ed O'Brien and Phoebe Ellsworth. And they're at the University of Michigan. So it was. Yeah, some of this stuff, it gets so complicated. It's like if you are in a cold environment and you're feeling cold, it was about projecting your feeling onto others, like your situation. And it was kind of more complicated. I actually had a little trouble understanding it myself because it wasn't the focus wasn't so much totally on empathy um, because I wasn't so sure about projection. Is empathy projecting? Um, but I don't know if I want to get into that. Right. Okay, but you know, if 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 uh, if um, Steve in the article is saying, well, it sounds like he would like uh, liberals to empathize with Zimmerman, in a sense, which I think is fair. I mean, that's, that's so I think so too. We should empathize with yeah. all sides in this. And that would really, and there's people who are judging Zimmerman, which I would say is not empathic to be calling him a racist and judging him. And I, I think all the, again, sort of going back to my nonviolent communication, you know, background, that I, I just think all these boxes that we put people in are, aren't helpful whether they're, they're a racist or they're not a racist, or they're a liberal or they're a conservative. They're, uh, you know, what we're really, we're throwing these words around and, and they end up just becoming moral judgments. They mm -hmm. end up becoming deserve language. Mm -hmm. They end up becoming our way of saying who, who should get what. And I, I, don't, I don't know that it's actually helpful in us connecting in meaningful ways about our differences so that we can actually find ways to to work together, live together, and 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 you know manage our conflicts. Yeah, I think that's what that study was about. That if you have all these boxes and categories, and uh, and they were using uh, Republican Democrat, that it was an inhibition. It inhibited the connection. So it's kind of like that's kind of what you're saying. Sounds like, that. And, and I think that's sort of the heart of nonviolent communication. Or even Dominic Bart. We were talking about Dominic Barter. A lot of his work is based in connection. Brene Brown and her work around empathy and connection. Um, that it, you know, there's there's a person who who basically is saying that if you want to do away with you know shame and guilt and these things that that the antidote for that is is empathy. Um, I forget Brene's exact words about you know put. <laughs> Putting those things into a petri dish and adding empathy, and and no harm will come. And so it's it's curious for me to read this article, you know, pitting empathy and compassion against each other. Yeah. When both are just integral parts of us building connection. Well, it'd be and, easier to uh, talk with um, with both with uh, Kevin and Steve. Uh, you know, kind of on a, in a dialogue like this would make it a little bit easier to kind of be able to connect more deeply mm. with what it is that they're what it is that you know their values are and their needs and because it's in a sense it sounds like he's saying that liberals aren't aren't empathizing with Clarence Thomas and with Sarah Palin, right? It's like and because they're be, Oh, it's like liberals value empathy. They're they're not empathizing in a sense. They're not empathizing with Clarence Thomas and uh, Sarah Palin. 
so empathy is kind of like bad or something. I don't know. It's it's like my poor brain. Right. Well, <laughs> somehow I mean, look the at, logic. Look at what he, writes. Uh -huh. he writes, compassion beckons one to serve an individual and his or her unique needs. Well, empathy does that too. Yeah. He also writes, it's a call to action. It's why conservative leaders, leaders have a long history of charitable giving, while liberals, I'm not mentioning the names he's written, um, liberals are remarkably miserly. Uh, those are some really blanket generalizations about people. I'm sure there's some really stingy conservatives, and I bet there's some really stingy um, progressives or, or, or liberals. I'm sure there's some of both on both ends. But to make such blank, blanket statements about people isn't, isn't helpful for us. It's not connecting for us. And I'd be concerned about really creating understanding and connections when we're, when we're really putting in, you know, of course, all of the conservatives have a long history of charitable giving and all those other people appear to be stingy. Well, I, I, I don't, I bet that's too blanket of a statement for me. I'd rather more, I'd rather less generalizations and more um, individualistic notion. I'm sure there's a little of each on both sides. Yeah, I would. What I what I am looking at is how do we create a culture of empathy, and for me that means everyone trying to deepen our empathy for everyone else, and that means uh, empathizing with Sarah Palin. What is it that's important to Sarah Palin? What are her values? You know, what is going on for her? The same thing with empathizing with uh, Clarence Thomas. And for, you know, I would encourage them to say, yeah, let's have a culture of empathy where they try to empathize with, you know, people on all, you know, on, on you know, the liberal side or wherever, or even getting away from um, of those uh, categories. But the thing is, is that the empathy for me, I guess I should be better, should more be speaking from my point of view or, you know, instead of maybe I'm, you know, trying to analyze this and try to take it apart. Then really for me, it's like we should be, I want to be empathizing, you know, creating a greater environment for of empathy, and that includes empathizing with uh, Steve. You know, listening to what Steve is important to the author here, what is important to Clarence Thomas, what is important to you know everyone, trying to deepen that overall connection. I agree. I I absolutely agree. So I, I'd be curious if, if these guys would, would be interested in having a dialogue about what they've written, or at least Steve, yeah. and, and say, you know, what, what is it you are trying to say here? And is there a way we could do it that, that we'd really hear what's being said? Yeah. So and we'd really offer I, I, empathy, really empathize with, create a... Yes, I'd like to offer Steve some empathy. What? <laughs> I'd like to offer Steve some empathy yeah, me too. about what it is he's frustrated about, what it is he's trying to say, and quite frankly, I'm not fully understanding it the way he's written it. Yeah. And well, really, my challenge is that it's hard for me to see past some of the, the, the black and white generalizations that all liberals are this, or all conservatives are that, or that compassion equals one thing and empathy equals another thing. And, and I, I, there's not a lot of gray in there. Yeah, or maybe he's just trying to get some clarity. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. You know, Could he's be. just trying to get a sense of clarity, and and uh, and this is just an attempt at that clarity. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, well, there's there's more to it, but maybe we could we could end there, just saying that we're we're open for dialoguing more about it directly with. Uh, with both Steve and Kevin. Yeah. And uh, we invite you, if you're watching this, or uh, to uh, join us and let's have a dialogue about this. And I think what is important is that people, people get an understanding of what empathy actually is and how it works. Yeah. Rather than, I think my other concern is that I want, I want the information out there about empathy, especially when there's so much research right now telling us how important empathy is. And, it, you know, there's Mary Gordon's work 
uh, about you know empathy the empathy truly being the antidote for shame the antidote for bullying the, you know we need more empathy in the world so any article i see out there talking about how empathy is a bad thing uh, i'm concerned because it it sends a message out there that's counter to all of the research that i'm seeing you know dan pink in his book uh, a whole new mind uh, it devoted an entire chapter to empathy and how important empathy is in the workplace and that going forward we need empathy to have better work situations you know same thing from um, the book wired to care um, how companies and organizations thrive with widespread empathy uh, Marie Mayashiro the empathy factor again we need empathy like and, and of course you can't ignore Brene Brown's TED Talks about the power of vulnerability and her latest one about uh, listening to shame. You watch both of those talks and the message is clear. Empathy is, 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 is not even slightly important. It's massively important. So here we are trying to create that culture of empathy and get people to wrap their, their head around it. And then there's you know sort of misinformation that comes along and says, no, 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 empathy is a bad thing. Well... That's not what all the researchers are saying. So tell us how you came to this conclusion that empathy is a bad thing. Yeah, and we want to empathize with you. We, we, are, we want to use empathy to empathize with your concerns yeah. about how empathy is a bad thing. There, if empathy is a bad thing, there's obviously some kind of, uh, uh, I guess, maybe fear about it, that empathy might be a bad thing. If it's a bad thing, I imagine that there's some concerns there, and I would like to address those and hear about them yeah. and really see what's you know underlying those uh, concerns. Absolutely. So, so I have 12 minutes of battery power. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Um, I think we've uh, we're uh, we've kind of gone into it and willing to continue this dialogue, and um, I'll put this on the on the web and put a link to it on, by their article and perhaps uh, they'll engage in a dialogue perhaps mm. perhaps so ah. okay well that's that's our this is installment uh, our second installment for the empathy emergency response team so thank you <laughs> Uh, Joe for joining. We had a great, actually a great discussion with uh, Victoria Pynchon, who had also wrote an article uh, about kind of the limits of empathy. And we had a, I really enjoyed that. And I felt and like I'm, we, helping, I'm reading her book now. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I actually was reading a bit of it today on the beach. Uh, her book about, uh, you know, success as a mediator for dummies. <laughs> and it, it's actually a, a it's a great book. I, you know, I, there's a lot of there's a lot of like good nuggets in there about you know making a living as a mediator. Um, so it's it's a, a nice relationship. I think we've built working on having a nice friendship. Yeah, so, we converted you know. what I thought was like a little bit of an attack on empathy into a friendship. So I mean, nothing that's that's I find that a real she success. She says very positive things in her book about empathy. Uh huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Oh, good. Well, okay. Well, I'll uh, stop then at this point, and we hope to hear from uh, both Kevin and Steve, uh, and yeah. looking forward to perhaps chatting with you. Awesome. I will talk to you later. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.